Hi friends, welcome to the All-Canadian Reptile Girl with me, Annalise. If you ask a reptile person if a snake is poisonous, you'll probably get a lecture on the difference between poison and venom, and that snakes are venomous, not poisonous. Well, a short time ago, after being that person and explaining to a friend the difference between poison and venom, they asked me, well, are there any poisonous snakes? That's a great question. Let's find out. I think that the first thing that we should do is make sure that we all share the same understanding of what poisonous and venomous mean. Both are toxic substances that disrupt normal bodily functions. The difference between venom and poison is how these toxins get into you. A venomous animal needs to inject its toxins into you, either by biting or stinging you. Whereas a poisonous animal's toxins needs to be either ingested, absorbed through your skin, or inhaled. I did a whole video not too long ago about the different types of snake venom and how they've evolved. And if you'd like, you can check that out here. There are exceptions, of course, but generally speaking, venomous species use venom offensively as a way to subdue prey. It is certainly effective as a defense, if needed, but the primary purpose is to kill or immobilize prey, while poison is primarily a defense mechanism used to make a predator release them once they realize that their mouth is full of terrible tasting poison and that continuing to eat the poisonous animal will result in sickness or even death. As for today's topic, are there poisonous snakes? The answer is yes. You didn't see that coming? Just like there are different types of venomous snakes, there are also different types of poisonous snakes with different ways to store and deliver their poison. The most sophisticated way is something called a nugal gland. There are 17 known species that have these glands, belonging to three different genuses. No, that's not right. Genera, no, genera, that's it. The most well known is the tiger keelback, an arboreal colubrid from Southeast Asia. I don't have one of these guys to share with you today, but I do have my very own arboreal snake from a different part of Southeast Asia. Hobbs, my Macklots python. Say hi, buddy. Tiger tailbacks are really cool. See these? These are the snake's nuchal glands, and they store the snake's toxins. Here's what they look like below the skin. When a predator comes along and wants to chow down on a tiger keelback, they will flatten out their neck, which kind of enlarges these glands, and then, when pressure is applied, they secrete some goop, and the predator gets a mouthful of poison. They can also swing their head around at whatever is threatening them and smack them with their glands. This is called, and I wish I was joking, a neck butt. The impact will break open the nuchal glands, smearing the irritating poison into the predator's skin, eyes, or mouth. Like venom, poison is complex and full of all sorts of different chemicals and compounds. Producing poison is a biologically expensive process and very difficult. So, how do snakes produce their poison? Easy! They don't. but they don't make their own poison. Hmm. Well, snakes are nothing if not efficient. So, their solution to not making poison is to steal it. But how do they do that? I'll tell you. From eating other poisonous animals, specifically toads. How cool is that? Well, not for the toads. But it's the fact that they can consume something known to be poisonous, and the snake has the ability to not only survive unharmed, but to extract and store those toxins and use them for their own self-defense. That's pretty cool. The toads do all the hard work making their toxic cocktails and storing them in glands of their own on their back, and when the tiger keelback attacks them, all the toads' hard work is rewarded by being eaten and having their poison that was supposed to keep them safe being stolen, absorbed, and stored in the snake's nuchal glands. On a side note, in case being poisonous was not tough enough, 
The tiger keelback snake is also venomous. I guess it just likes to keep all of its options open? Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, all of the poisonous snakes that we're talking about today are both venomous and poisonous. Or at least, sometimes they are. I promise I'll explain that in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the hognose snake. Yes, the cutest snake in the entire world. You don't believe me? Just Google, hognose snakes wearing hats and mustaches. You'll see for yourself. You know what? I'll actually save you the trouble. I'll show you right now. He's so fancy! <laughs> I told you they're the cutest. Hognoses live here in North America. Well, there's the Madagascar hognose. And the South American hognose too, I guess. But they're different genera. These guys are rear fang venomous, but don't worry, I'm not in any danger. Not only is this guy super sweet, as you can see, but his venom is about as potent as a bad bee sting, and with his fangs at the back of his mouth, he'd have a pretty hard time getting it into me. Anyway, in the wild, these adorable little noodles will also eat toads as a regular part of their diet. And yes, these toads secrete toxins. And yes, the hognose will absorb and store these toxins, just like the tiger keelback. But do you notice something different about this snake? Aside from the off the charts cuteness. Where are his nuchal glands? No nuchal glands? Yeah, I don't see them either. So where does this adorable hognose snake store the toxins it would get from toads? The answer, everywhere. All of the snakes that we're talking about today use something called dietary sequestration, which is the process of taking and storing toxins instead of being harmed or poisoned by them. In snakes with nuchal glands, this process shuttles the toxins straight into the glands where they are stockpiled and concentrated until needed. In snakes without nuchal glands, like hognose snakes, kind of just keep the poison all over their body in their tissue, which is still pretty cool. There are advantages and disadvantages to each method. The concentrated poison in the nuchal glands means that if a predator were to bite those glands, they'd be getting a much more powerful dose and an immediate warning that something was off, and they would get much sicker sooner. This is why keelbacks lead with their head or neck and hit them with the old neck butt that I talked about earlier, hoping for a quick bite and then a blech from their attacker. On the flip side, smart predators have figured out that they can just eat everywhere but the head and neck and be fine. Storing the toxin all over requires far fewer biological processes, structures, or mechanisms. It also means that the predator can be poisoned no matter where on the snake it bites. But the poison is also more diffused and the concentration is not high enough to be lethal. The predator may just experience a really foul taste and not get sick until much later or even at all. This may not help the specific hognose snake that is being eaten at that moment, but the tasting terrible and or causing illness may make a predator think twice before snacking on a hognose snake in the future. The definition of taking one for the team, I guess, in the worst way possible. This could also be why hognose snakes have developed a bit of a flair for the dramatic. Because, when threatened, hognose snakes will play dead, rolling over on their back, opening their mouth wide, and dangling their tongue out. So convincing. They complete the deception often by pooping or regurgitating any food that they may not have completely finished digesting. I'm sure the smell is just wonderful. Which, along with their black belly, might suggest to a predator that the meal is rotten. If they are brave and take a bite anyway, the bitter toxic flesh will reinforce the this milk is way past its due date vibe that they're going for. Pretty neat, eh? Now, enough about those little shovel-faced dirt scoopers, and on to another favorite of mine, garter snakes. Yep, these amazing little guys can be poisonous too. And yes, just like hognose snakes and tiger keelbacks, these guys get their poison from their meals, specifically toads, newts, and salamanders. And like the hognose snake, these guys store it throughout their entire body and not in specialized nuchal glands like the tiger keelback. I guess I need to go back to my garter video and add another superpower. 
We don't really know how many other types of poisonous snake species there are without nuchal glands because, well, we usually don't actively seek out snakes as a regular part of our diet. If we did, we might know exactly which snakes are safe to eat and which ones would give you a potentially lethal case of tongue rumbles. There's another little wrinkle about identifying poisonous snakes, which makes it hard to know who's poisonous and who's not. Poisonous snakes aren't always poisonous. It makes sense if you think about it. They rely on their toxic prey for their poison. If they aren't eating the toads, newts, or salamanders that have the toxins, they aren't going to be poisonous. When we keep garters or hognose snakes in captivity, we usually don't feed them poisonous animals. Or, if they live in a place that doesn't provide their poisonous prey, they would be perfectly safe for a predator to snack on and would be not toxic at all. I feed my garter snakes worms, pinkies, fish, or chicken hearts. And my hognose snake gets fuzzies. None of these food items provide the toxins that they would need to be poisonous. But even if they were poisonous, there is no threat to me handling either a garter or a hognose snake at home or in the wild because their poison is not passed through their skin to me. I would basically have to eat them. And that is probably never going to happen. Ever. In doing additional research for this topic, I learned one really neat thing about tiger keelbacks that I'd like to share with you. It involved two separate populations of tiger keelbacks living on two different islands. One population had access to toads that were toxic, and the other did not. Obviously, the population that had access to the toxic toads was poisonous, and the other was not. But there was also a distinct difference in the way that they behaved around predators. The poisonous population was less afraid, and would stand its ground, while the non-poisonous population behaved more like typical prey, and would try to play dead or run away. This indicated that the tiger keelback somehow was aware of its own toxicity levels. What? Right? Scientists aren't really sure how this happens yet, but I think it is just another reason why these creatures are so amazing, and why all reptiles and amphibians need our assistance in their conservation and continued survival. We still have so much to learn. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning a bit about poisonous snakes and how they acquire, store, and use the poisons that they eat. If you like this video, please hit the subscribe button, the like button, the bell button, your belly button, really any button that you would like, and check out my other videos. It really does help me out a lot. You can also follow me on Instagram where I post stuff on my reptiles daily. Thanks for watching me, the All Canadian Reptile Girl, and my reptiles. Until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye! No, there is not. You must there only. Are no, his only hide is my pocket. He's mine. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have a choice. This is. He's fine, I guess. But he's, he's just gonna do what he wants. I don't think I have a say in this. He's just gonna keep puffing away if I do anything else. Spoiled snake. All hope is lost. He's in my shirt down. Oh, his head's right here. Oh, now he's huffing from the inside of my shirt. I did. He is the one who held me hostage first. It's not my fault. Oh my goodness, I can eat the cutest little beans. I just want to eat them. As for <laughs> I really do. Okay. You've got to If you don't, you'll be eaten in your sleep.